Uh, we'll hear the next year from the Dr. The Wen uh, Lei. The, she is the assistant professor in the Department of uh, uh, Geography at the Ohio State University. Um, her research lies in the intersection of transportation, environment, health, and well-being. Her research focuses on the uh, three major themes. One is the uh, measuring and modeling urban transportation demands. Second, impact of uh, information and uh, communication technology on transportation. And third is the physical and mental health outcomes resulting from the um, um, daily travel and activities. Her presentation today is the title, the Active Space, Environmental Exposure, and the sub Subjective, again, Well-Being. Uh, she will uh, share with us her a study and uh, a finding using the smartphone-based survey data from the metropolitan area in the U.S. Um, to quantify the impacts of activity space and exposure to nature and uh, uh, air pollution on the uh, momentary moons and uh, overall subjective well-beings. Dr. Lei. Thanks, Jen Fu. And um, again, thank you very much, Yingling and the uh, Dana Makeup team for organizing such a wonderful event. Um, so today I'm going to present on behalf of my research group on uh, the research question, how would activity space and environmental exposure affect subjective well-being? And so I'd like to introduce briefly the research team, um, Dr. Yingling Fan, you already know, um, Dr. Steve Hankey at Virginia Tech, my dissertation, uh, my PhD advisor, and Dr. Trevon Glasgow, now at Virginia Commonwealth University. So this study we conducted when I was at Virginia Tech doing my uh, PhD dissertation. Is this based on that? And also shout out to Dynamica team um, who supported a lot uh, during this data collection, especially Dr. Kitty Das, you already heard from him. Um, Wenyi, Chen Fu, and the rest of the team for a lot of support during the data collection period. In fact, Kitty provided us, uh, you know, his effort provided us half of a sample in this study. So briefly about transportation and health, um, <clears throat> there's a lot of benefits and risks associated with everyday travel. First, for physical health, we have a lot more evidence on this domain that could be a lot of benefit associated with physical activity if participants uh, involved in active travel. And there's also risks, especially for exposure during, uh, during travel to environmental hazards, such as air pollution, noise pollution, crashes, um, and heat. Now, in the domain of mental health, it's much less explored, but there's accumulating literature on this. And over the past five, oh, sorry, seven years now, that uh, I've been looking at travel-related well-being, especially for hedonic and eudaimonic well-being. But in the study, we present only the hedonic well-being part, which is the assessment of uh, the, the presence and absence of pain, the presence of, of uh, positive mood and absence of pain, and so on. Now, activity participation is another pathway that transportation can affect mental health in the sense that if we um, if travelers have more opportunity to go and, and participate in our home activities, that's more likely to promote their well-being and reduce the risk for loneliness, anxiety, or um, social isolation. The last pathway that uh, we like to discuss in this study is exposure to the environment. Um, that could include air pollution, traffic, stress, and noise, and especially green space, that uh, Dr. Gailey already um, present uh, previously. <clears throat> so a bit of background research on travel and momentary well-being. That's um, more and more studies have shown that active travelers have found to have a better mood, positive mood, or more satisfied with their travel than you know drivers or public transport users. And Mood also found that it will vary based on the environment that these users are exposed to. If you travel through the built environment or urban buildup, it's more likely to have uh, less positive mood and more negative mood. And uh, in contrast, if you travel through the natural environments, you're more likely to have more positive moods. That's just the result from Dr. Gailey uh, presented earlier. And that could be explained by a theory called attention restoration theories. That means 
when you expose to the natural environment, it has fewer stimulations that could deplete your, your resources and energy, and that promotes better well-being. Now, another domain that I like to introduce here that's particularly um, a focus that we are talking today, which is activity space. Now, activity space is basically a, a group of measurements to measure where people are, the geographical areas that people spend time on during a period of time. Um, and, and Dr. Ying Song already touched on this with her uh, convex home measure. So here we also introduced another set of measures in addition to convex hall, and this is to measure where people are, a number of unique locations that they visit, and um, number of, um, or, or distance travel, and the, number, the amount of time that they spend, where are the locations that they spend most of the time on during the course of a week or two based on our study period. Now there's a lot of, well not a lot, but there are studies on activity space and physical health, especially physical activity, but much less in the domain of mental health. And much of that in the mental health domain focus on the clinical symptoms such as depression, anxiety, loneliness. And their study found that limited activity space is associated with depression or um, you know, distance travels related to anxiety, um, affect or stress, or the irre irregularity in travel, especially uh, you don't travel frequently, you stay home a lot, this is a kind of predictor for depression and loneliness. So, so more and more studies have emerged in the clinical mental health. Now there's research gaps that I like to identify here that we, we like to address with this research. It's the lack of standardized measures of travel emotions during travel. So here we introduced a travel mood scale created by my collaborator, Travan Glasgow. And he also test, uh, he tested that for his thesis and we applied to uh, another studies and tested that it was reliable. So we used that for this, this study. Now, there's also a lack of real-time repeated measure of emotions and satisfaction. And we know that this is very momentary. There's very a lot based on the, the time of day, the weather, and all the environmental factors you're exposed to. So we really need this repeatedly measure within an amount of time, a period of time. And there's also a limitation of self-reported surveys that tend to be uh, subject to recall bias. Um, especially when we assign people with a sheet of paper to fill out all of the activities or travel they, they did during the day. There's, there's no way people can really accurately recall everything. So objective measures such as GPS tracking that we have in Dynamica is really uh, an improvement. Now there's a lack of comparisons among trip purposes. So Past study looked at either commute trips or leisure trips, so there's much fewer studies that look at a whole lot of different types of travel. Um, there's also lack of travel of, of spatial coverage. So here we are looking at multiple cities instead of one single city, and we like to see if this really, uh, the effects of activity space and environmental exposure really carry across geographical um, area. And there's also lack of evidence of travel and well-being. Um, I just realized that I accidentally deleted a very important slide, which is continued research gap, that is the focus on dynamic uh, environmental exposure. So past study focused a lot on home-based exposure, so it's, as Dr. Gailey said, and not just green space. There's uh, air noise pollution, air pollution and other environmental risks, we tend to just look at home-based measure. Now, there's a lot of time that we really expose to this risk during travel and not, um, not home-based, such as work or school, so that's a big limitation in the literature. Another limitation is focusing or um, omitting the effect of travel modes. The way we travel and the speed or, or the route that we choose, all of that really affect the measurement of well-being and the past literature hasn't really looked into that, especially in the exposure um, assessment domains. And another, another uh, limitation is, as I mentioned, this focus more on clinical sense of mental health and not much in the sense of well-being, more kind of preventive measure, how we can detect or early detection of mental health 
issues if we look at the well-being or cumulative sense. So with that in mind, we uh, would like to address this limitation by collecting data. This is two separate study, one in Minneapolis that Dr. Das has, has mentioned in his presentation. There's a lot of effort there. In parallel, we, we actually started our Virginia Tech data collection a bit earlier and ended that a bit later. And we collected in three cities, Blacksburg, Virginia, Roanoke, and Washington, DC. These are three level. One, Blacksburg is a very small town, Roanoke, medium size, and, and DC is a big city, along with Minneapolis. So we have a wide range of type of cities in here so that we can understand more on the impacts of the, not just travel behavior, but the built environment. So I, I would go very briefly on data collection methods. Uh, it's quite similar to what Dr. Das has mentioned. The two study that said collected independently for different purposes, but for this study that I'm presenting, there's a bunch of, uh, of variables that we, uh, we dig out and, and remeasure. These are pretty consistent between the two study, except for a few things. One, in the Virginia Tech study, we look at one to two weeks of data collection versus the Minneapolis sample this one week. Another uh, difference is that in the Virginia Tech study, we use the travel mood scale. So it's a, a semantic differential scales, and we asked people to kind of put in a slice from the negative to positive emotions as a nine item scale. It's different from the way well-being is measured in the Minneapolis sample, which is based on the American Time Use Survey um, measure that you see most of the presenter actually based on that. So that's the difference between the two studies. And because of that, I split the two models. I don't lump all the data together, but look at them differently and also to test whether the way we, are, we measure well-being really change um, or really make a difference in the effects so this is an example of one person's activity space, like how she traveled in the city of Roanoke, Virginia, <clears throat> over the course of data collection. And overall, after cleaning, we keep uh, in the Virginia DC sample, uh, we have 9,000 trips, but I only keep three, more than 3,000 trips for completed surveys. We started out with 250 people that completed the entire study, but for this particular study, we clean up and keep only 153 people. Um, for the Minneapolis sample, there's 12,000 trips with completed surveys, uh, more than 300 people. As the number of GPS records slightly smaller, I can't explain that. I'll look into that further. So this is how we derive measures for, for dynamic exposure. So for activity space and exposure, we have, thank you, uh, 95 percent confidence ellipse. This is weighted by travel time. So basically, this is the ellipse that cover all the important areas that this person spend most of the time during the data collection period. The number of unique locations that they visited during this time. So we don't just count the number of destinations. We count what's unique. And the distance travel, we uh, normalized using travel duration to be mindful of the fact that people travel with different modes and different speed. Entropy is to, visit, to kind of um, capture the irregularity in the, in the movement. Uh, for green space, water, and POI is the point of interest, which is a measure of, of urban, um, it's a proxy for urban area. So more POI or more point of interest means more urbanized. So these measures, we measure at 50 meter buffer along the travel route, but at origin destination, we increase this buffer size to 500, knowing that they spend more time here, so that's why we, we have the larger buffer. Air, air pollutions we got from cases, I can't really spell, I uh, can't really pronounce the, the acronym, but uh, we use the model data at the block group level for PM2.5 and nitrogen dioxide. Now for subjective well-being, that said, the way we measured earlier with two different scales. Here we put out, sorry, typo here, supposed to be net affect and peak affect. Net affect is we subtract the average positive emotion to negative emotions. Peak affect is we subtract the peak positive emotion to the peak negative emotions. 
So that's how we measure our skip the participant profile for interest of time. We rent to a multi-level regression model, knowing, keeping in mind the fact that we have the people, person level, and the trip level. So activity space measure at person level over the course of the data collection period, and then there's uh, various variable for the trip level. And here in the model, show the model significant results. I like to, to explain the color code. Any times that we have a variable that is positive, sorry, is significant in the net affect model, it will be shown in blue, uh, and purple for peak affect model only. When it's significant in both peak affect and net affect, it will be shown in orange. So here we found that green space and blue space are positively associated with both net affect and peak affect, which is expected. Um, travel time, commute, commute trip, errand trips, other trips, these are trip purposes, bus trip, and uh, NO2, uh, sorry, yeah, NO2 concentrations are negatively associated with both peak and net affect, except for bus trip. And there's also in the Virginia NDC sample, we didn't find any significant effect on the number of point interest, which is a proxy for urbanized area. Um, and activity space didn't really make an impact here. Uh, and also PM 2.5. Now in the Minnesota sample, we found some conflicting result, but let me present the, the regular one first. We found the positive association of net affect and peak affect on um, green space and blue space and some activity space measures such as ellipse, uh, confidence ellipse area, convex hall, um, and number of unique locations. We also found that NO2 actually had positive association in the peak affect model, which is unexpected because you think that exposure to traffic pollution and or to traffic volume really drive out well-being, but it's actually we found the opposite effect in the net affect model. Um, there's also a number of uh, kind of uh, mode, travel modes, such as bike trip and leisure trips, tend to boost the well-being in both net affect and peak affect. Again, we couldn't find anything significant with PM 2.5. I know that some study shows that PM 2.5 tends to reduce well-being. That's not the case in our study here. And we find conflicting results in this Minnesota sample a lot when it comes to peak and net affect. So let me draw to conclusion quickly for the interest of time. We also found that active travel modes generally um, improve well-being, but result in the same sample, the significance effect really vary by the way we measure well-being, whether it's peak affect or net affect. Now, across the board, greens and blue, green space and blue space really boost net and peak affect. Now, NO2 generally tend to drive, drive down uh, well-being. Uh, perhaps it's because NO2 is really correlated with traffic volume, which also um, induces more, more stress. But um, that said, we still find this inconsistent finding. And we found that larger activity space is associated with um, stronger well-being. And although this is only significant in the Minnesota sample, uh, much stronger. So here's a, a few limitations that I like to point out as non-representative sample. Uh, during this time of data collection, Dynamica only worked with Android, but now it's, it's totally different. That It's wonderful to hear that Dynamica now are compatible with both Android and iOS. Um, we have GPS sig signal loss a lot during the DC data collection because of underground chain. Um, and air quality data here, I think part of the um, <clears throat> The caveat here is that air quality data is derived at the block group level and is temporally mismatched with uh, our data here because the time of data collection doesn't completely match, it's one year apart. And we also use cell report measures that we hope to use, com you know, combine that with wearable device to, to measure physiological responses in, a, in addition to cell report mood or well-being report here. So in the next step, we, we look into more um, environmental exposure uh, or more environmental risks. So our ongoing study in Columbus area, we look at noise and heat in addition to green space and also in traffic congestion. 
um, and, and air pollution. And um, we also look at uh, more rigorous tests for well-being measure here um, at different time frames so that we can see which ones are most sensitive. Is that momentary well-being or average out by weekly or daily level? So with that, thank you very much, and thanks to my research team as well. Thank you, Dr. Lei, for that interesting presentation. We can take a question. Ching Wu. Thank you very much, Dr. Lee. It was really great presentation. I'm, I'm very uh, inspired by your presentation. Uh, I have a question about the data collection, data reliability. I'm also a heavy user of the Dynamica app as a researcher, and I have been collecting a lot of GPS data. But somehow, uh, G Dynamica app is very good, but somehow the, it's wrongly detected the app user's outdoor trip mode. For example, I walked, but app showing I drive. In that case, subject had to modify their app by themselves, but sometimes they are ready to do this, so they report it wrong way. So in my research, I'm, I try to check the, whether they reported the trip mode where or not using GPS data, but since you have a lot of data, large-scale large scale GPS data, so did you check about, I, I just wanted to know the process of to assure your collected data from the Dynamica app. So this is my question, thank you. Thank you for the question. That's, that's a really good point. Um, in fact, yes, during my, this is my, derived from my dissertation work, that was a big time that we really tested the GPS points. And as you know, it's not, it's, not unique to Dynamica, I would say. I use other apps as well, and this is, this is a very common issue. The reason is because the GPS tracked point could jump all the way, so that would drive the distance, and um, so that I think that contribute to the, the error. So the way we did back then, and now that I, I look more into that other, my other data sets, uh, the way we do is to, to double check that, and you could either, one way to do it is to derive maybe a, a, a machine learning model to predict modes. So if you have ground true data or the kind of data that you're really confident on, so when you check and you're sure like, okay, this is really walk trip, this is really drive trip, that will be the ground true data, and then you can develop some machine learning model based on the a few variables such as uh, speed um, and, and uh, acceleration rate and, and others. So there's a few papers that I could share with you offline. So for the interest of time, um, there's really good papers that help us like, to boost the confidence that, okay, this is the good thing. But that said, I, I would um, reiterate that this is very common in, in GPS tracking in general for any apps. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Lee. Um, one comment about the air pollution results that you found is that the cases data is an annual average, so it doesn't really pick up those temporal differences. There are some new models that recently came out which actually give high resolution spatial data at daily levels, and that may be more useful for picking up some of those finer differences and, and capturing some of that temporal robustness that you get from the Dynamica. So, that may give you some different findings. Yeah, thank you very much. That's an excellent comment. Um, so I, I would like to talk to you later about that model, but later in a follow-up study, we indeed just address this, this concern that, yes, temporally mismatch and this highly ag aggregated. So that's indeed the biggest limitation here, and I like to point out in future studies that, uh, that we are doing now is that the temporal aggregation and spatial aggregation really make a bias in, in this measure. But that's a really great comment. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you for the question, comments, and for the Dr. Lisa uh, uh, presentation. Let's give her a hand. Thank you.